Thank you, Katie. Thank you, everybody who's here. Good morning, everybody. Well, I, I want to talk about community today. I'm also um, going to talk about um, something I'm studying with Andrea Martin. She's exploring the Paramitas with me. And I want to talk the world, I want to talk, I was a student of Katagiri Roshi and I would like to share some stories about that. And I want to talk about the world of mycelium and how that inspires me. Um, I've been um, studying the paramitas and um, applying them to my life. Um, uh, like every paramita is a filter for uh, how I can reflect on how I react to my everyday life, to people, to my internal dialogue with myself. And it's, it's very helpful. Um, I also uh, have a wonderful list and summary of the Paramitas from Pema Chodron. Um, and she explains the Paramitas as six ways of compassionate living. She, she sees the Paramitas as preparation for becoming a Bodhisattva. Uh, we get the barriers out of our, we can get out of our own way so that uh, we can be more helpful to others. And particularly in um, including ourselves in compassion, uh, which is kind of a new concept for me, uh, introduced to it somewhat through loving kindness meditation um, and uh, it's, it never occurred to me that compassion had to start with myself. Um, I thought, come on, get on with it. I've got to get some compassion here. Uh, and a lot of what happens with me in my life is that something will come up and I'm just reactive to it. Um, uh, it's hard to be in the moment when you're discussing something and all of a sudden this sense of being in danger comes on you and your brain shuts off and then you're uh, not in the present. You're not living right here. So um, we've been looking at the sixth paramita, which is prajna, a Sanskrit word that Pema Chodron translates as transcendent wisdom. And then she says, Prajna. Prajna, cultivating an open, inquiring mind. So, yeah, that's great. I would like that. That's terrific. And then she goes on to describe. The only reason we don't open our hearts and minds to other people is that they trigger confusion in us. That we don't feel brave enough or sane enough to deal with. Bam, story of my life. And I'm here, I'm part of this community. And um, really thinking about one of the three refuges Sangha. Sangha is community, Sangha. This is very confusing for me. What does it mean to be part of this community, other communities, other groups, part of a family, part of a relationship? What does it mean to be a human living on this planet today. And then my first reaction is exhaustion, feeling overwhelmed. How much energy will it take to participate? Where do I begin 
and the group ends. And this kind of dilemma is pretty common for me. Um, it, it, it stops the flow of life for me. Uh, I'll feel connected in lots of different situations and then I'll feel this kind of conflict. So I, I, I'd like to kind of tell you how uh, my Zen journey started. Um, I uh, studied um, world religions in college and that semester I met someone who taught me how to sit Zazen. And uh, we developed a friendship, we got married and we moved to San Francisco to study at San Francisco Zen Center. And Tony was already a student of Suzuki Roshi's. Uh, I started sitting Zazen there in 1968. And Suzuki gave talks on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, on Saturday mornings. Um, we were working and living in Oakland across the bay but we drove over to San Francisco twice a week. Dining Katagiri um, came into our lives a couple of years later. He'd been in San Francisco. He'd been in Los Angeles first, uh, uh, helping with the, um, the Zen community there. And then he came up to San Francisco to help both with the, um, Japanese community and um, later giving talks um, um, for American students. So on some Wednesday nights, he would um, give a talk using this big blackboard um, and he would write the terms in both English and in, um, in Japanese as he struggled to use English to explain Zen, it, it was pretty much incomprehensible. It was excruciating to listen to him. And I would think, oh no, Katagiri is gonna talk tonight. Because I wanted to hear Suzuki because he was poetic, he was elegant, spare of speech, uh, almost a haiku style of expressing the teaching. And when he spoke, I experienced just an incredible sense of stillness. Um, and although he also didn't have at all perfect English, somehow what he communicated was very accessible to me. He somehow was able to say it very simply. Katagiri Roshi knew that he wasn't reaching us, but he would say, I have to stand up right here, right now. Um, and he would always say, well, I can't explain, but I have to say something. And, um, and this is a man who went to Komazawa University. He studied at a Heiji monastery. He had a very similar education to Suzuki Roshi's. He was a scholar, he was a Zen teacher, and I could feel a deep sense of something that I also felt in, Katagiri, in Suzuki's presence. And I knew I had to work harder to experience this in myself. I moved to Minneapolis to study with him. Uh, and when I moved with my husband, Tony, and my daughter, Annie, to Minneapolis in 1973, we lived near the first Zen Center, which was in South, Southeast Minneapolis. So the, the, center, was the, uh, the center was in a fourplex um, apartment building. And um, the Katagiri, Roshi, Tomoe Katagiri, and their two sons, Yasuhiko and Eijo, they lived on the first floor. And on the second floor, 
the group of Zen students who were supporting this in the Twin Cities um, rented a upstairs apartment that they cleared out, cleaned, and made into a, the Zen Center, the place where we all sat Zazen together, did retreats, and where Roshi gave his lecture every, every week, two lectures every week. And um, the Katagiri family um, were right underneath Zen Center's activities, retreats, lectures, daily zazen, morning and evening. And this meant that Tomoy and the boys had to be quiet a lot. And the boys had to share their dad with all of his students. I remember this is a story um, of just Roshi and I talking. So I remember sitting on the front steps of the apartment building of Zen Center one day, and I was talking to Roshi, which is what I called him. And he stopped me, he looked at me, and he said, what happened to your hand? Oh yeah, I'm such a klutz. I cut myself chopping veggies and I laughed. But he looked at me and he showed real concern. And when he looks at you, he really looks at you. And he just said, please take good care of yourself. I was really embarrassed, but I let in that kindness and compassion. It just, it just reached me. My mind stopped spinning for a moment. I felt really seen and I sank deeper into my life a little bit. And that, that is what it was like studying with him. Um, um, a couple of years later, the Katagiri family went back to Japan for the first time for a visit. And he asked a member of the Sangha to be in charge while he was gone. A day or so before he left, I was cleaning the Zendo and he came upstairs to greet me. Zendo is what we call the, um, the upstairs space where we heard lectures and set meditation. Um, a day or so before he left, he was, I was cleaning the Zendo and he came upstairs to greet me. He said, if you have any problems while I'm gone, please ask Barbara. And I spit out, I'm not taking any orders from her. He looked very directly at me, looked around the room I was cleaning and then back at me and said, Focus on your practice. Let no dust alight. Then he turned around and went back downstairs. So I had an opportunity to feel what? Uh, embarrassed, but also something else. I could hear the words I said and I could feel the emotion I felt. And I was, it, it was all there, my exposed self. I never shared this story before, not because I was ashamed, which I was, but because I didn't share parts of myself easily with other people. My teacher saw me as I was. He didn't ask that I change. He just let me see myself. Zen practice has given me lots of opportunities to see myself experience stillness and feel something real. But in Zen community, Sangha, I often feel raw, exposed and uncomfortable. Being part of the Sangha, what does it mean? How am I connected to others? How does this work? 
I see that I don't open my mind and my heart to other people because as Pema Chodron says, they trigger confusion in me, that I don't feel brave enough or sane enough to deal with. I want to be a bodhisattva. I want to live a compassionate life. So I'm in Sangha to learn how to be in Sangha, how to be interconnected. Sangha for me is where the rubber meets the road. Meets the road. So this brings me to a subject that I currently looking at with great interest and inspiration these days, mycelium. Mycelium, yeah, mycelium. So I'll show you this book. So this is, this is a book by Paul Stamets called Mycelium Running. And, um, it's, it's an incredible exploration of the interconnectedness of life. Um, mycelium. They are fungi that form an almost hidden interconnected web of life. Paul Stamets writes that um, mycelium is a fine web of fungi cells, which in one phase of its life fruits mushrooms. He says this web runs through virtually all habitats, building soil and unlocking nutrient sources stored in plants and other organisms. Maybe mycelium webs are compassionate. Stamet says that when a catastrophe creates a field of debris, such as from downed trees or an oil spill, many fungi respond with producing waves, huge waves of mycelium that can decompose down trees, clean up oil spills. They have this, that they have this adaptability to respond to these conditions and know where they can be useful is, is really ancient. They have been around pretty much since living things started being on this earth. That ability reflects a deep rooted ancestry and diversity of fungi into the evolution of a whole kingdom of up to of 2 million species and many more that have not been identified. So 10% of fungi form mushrooms. The others um, create just an invisible network that permeates um, the whole fabric of the earth. Um, a lot of diversity because there's a lot of needs, a lot of many different needs. Um, they can respond helpfully to complex needs in the environment. A community, you could say. Paul Stamets writes that um, the, the green revolution, which was actually the chemical and fertilizer revolution, didn't turn out to be better living with chemistry. He says that fungi is nature's immune system. This interconnectedness interconnect is an obvious truth, he says, that we ignore at our peril. And I, I'm a, a gardener, my husband's a gardener, um, and we're, we, we do our gardening organically. Um, and we, we've been going to seed savers conventions since, since the 90s. And, um, uh, and we've also been going to Nobel conferences at Gustavus Adolphus College for years. And about three years ago, we went to the Nobel conference and the topic was the living soil. Presenters talked about composting, 
carbon sequestering, zero till agriculture. And they showed many examples of the soil not being some inert substrate, but a living community of plants, animals, insects, microorganisms, and mycelium. And that's where I first heard about this. Mycelium, the mother web of fine strands in the soil that give rise to mushrooms and other fungi. And at that conference, we heard a talk by Suzanne Simard, who is a professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia. Her topic, mother trees and mycelium. She and her students experimentally demonstrated that mycelium of certain mushrooms became paired with the root systems of specific tree species. They studied a group of three trees. The Douglas fir tree and the paper birch shared the same fungi companion at their root system. The cedar tree had a different fungi companion. So under the soil, a far reaching web of mycelium interconnects the roots of the individual trees, allowing them to interact at a distance um, with, from the uh, mycelium's wide web of moisture and nutrient wicking uh, net. Um, and the mycelium benefit from uh, living plants. They don't produce any nutrients on their own. So they benefit from the, the sugars in plants and, and they create soil by breaking down plants. But their, their web is so wide that it extends way beyond the root zone of of trees so that they pull in nutrients that aren't available to the trees right there. Um, so in the experiment, um, they covered the Douglas fir with a tarp as a way of creating shade so it couldn't photosynthesize its own nutrient needs. Photosynthesized carbon products are a major source of food for fungi, but it turns out they don't keep it all for themselves. They become a transportation system for it. Using radioactive carbon to track the transport of nutrients, they were able to demonstrate that the mycelium connected with the paper birch and transferred 10% of its carbon to the covered Douglas fir tree. So one species was supporting a different species through the mycelium web. This ability of one tree to feed another also explains how young trees in the understory of a, a big forest can survive under the huge shade canopy because mycelia are transporting nutrients from the mature mother trees to the young trees. Knowing about all this has really changed how I feel about gardening, which I've been doing all my life. Arjai and I haven't used fertilizers or pesticides, but living soil, interconnectedness, this goes beyond organic gardening. Last summer, we built a hugel, which is a raised bed garden that is based on the permaculture system of fostering beneficial plant relationships, including mycelium. And we dug a pit, a big pit, um, 10 feet long and, and five feet wide. And we filled it with logs and then leaves and then branches and then twigs and then soil and manure and compost and leaves and hay. And um, we've watched, it's, you know, it's got snow on it now. It's about, I don't know, three and a half feet high. But um, we see critters going in and out of it. 
you know, and uh, so we're, we're kind of watching it with interest. But, you know, in this in the spring, we'll be planting it for the first time and it will, you know, be one of our garden beds. Uh, and I've been composting for many years and um, and composting is an amazing, amazing process in itself. Uh, my uh, my husband RJ composts wherever he goes. He's just you know he just he will grab stuff and throw it on a certain soil area. Um, we also use a compost bin, um, and now we have a a big compost source because we'll just keep putting um, our uh, organic uh, compostables right on this pile, and um, it's. It's not just that carbon breaks down, but that all kinds of animals and bacteria and mycelium interact with all of these organic compounds. And it's been proven that mycelium can administer antibiotic properties to trees to save their life. Um, uh, there, uh, there's all this stuff that's going on beyond what we can see. And in a way you just have to live with, um, you have to live with the world you're in. We have, I have to live with my backyard um, on a daily basis. And in the summer during COVID, I spent more time in the garden than I've ever spent in a garden in my life. And every day, connecting with the fact that the world is suffering. We're all suffering, but um, nature is just going through its entire cycle. Birds returning, nest making, plants coming up, perennials coming up, weeds coming up, buckthorn coming up, trees leafing out, lake ice melting, ducks coming back, muskrats building nests. And I am so grateful for this year of being able to see that every day. And because my life before COVID was much more, I had a lot of appointments. I had a lot of things that I did with my time. I went to classes. Um, I, I had coffee with people two and three times a week. I hiked with friends several times a week. Um, I was in my car a lot going places to do things. And uh, RJ and I just laughed when, when sheltering in place started in March. So I don't think we filled our cars for a month. And um, so this year for me has been really incredible in terms of, I feel really connected to nature. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. Being able to have Zen Center available to me and RJ and I sit down every Sunday and, and listen to the lecture together. Um, I'm so grateful that we can sit retreats together, that we can go to classes together. It's not the same as being together, but it's been a lifesaver of, for me. And, and at first I, I had a lot of reactions against Zoom and um, not feeling other people's presence. And now, I don't know, I've just gotten over it. I mean, I absolutely acknowledge that uh, you all are out there. Um, my sisters and I have been talking every week on Zoom for a year, um, every Sunday, actually. And um, it, it has provided us an opportunity to carve that time out for ourselves to create a community 
um, that's really important to us. So nature um, has been something that um, helps me stay very connected to the earth um, and, and is incredibly reassuring to me. Um, I'm gonna hop back into my psyllium here and come back to community again in a little bit. Um, my psyllium steer the course of ecosystems. They favor the succession of species. They prepare the environment for their own benefit because they grow the things, they help grow the things that they need to eat. Um, but that also benefits so many other organisms. Mycelium is a keystone species. That's a species um, upon which other species in an ecosystem largely depend. If that keystone species weren't there, the ecosystem would change so drastically or it could collapse. Humans are not a keystone species. Paul Stamets proposes that if the other species on earth got a vote, we'd be voted out. Like mycelium, um, like mycelium's like all organisms, we have to eat. And to do that, they secrete enzymes and acids that dissolve rocks, trees, oil spills, and then they eat the minerals, trees, and oil spills. For example, the mycelium of oyster mushrooms really like petrochemical oil spills. So environmental remediators spray oyster mushroom spawn onto spills to detoxify the damage. Um, and because the feeding of mushrooms, the feeding mushrooms eat this carbon easily. And actually they, they, know, they don't find any traces of oil in the resulting mushrooms but they do find a lot of heavy metals, so they're not edible. I love the term fungus among us. It always makes me laugh, but now I love the term even more because understanding fungus is protecting this earth and understanding that I'm not a keystone species, but I am a member of the, this living community. I'm glad that we're organic gardeners. Um, I'm glad that um, um, I'm keeping um, keeping mindful of the um, the beauty of the earth, and that I'm just another animal on the earth, and um, I depend on this earth. So, uh, just a humility, and. Um, and I also know that um, being out outside every day, even in winter, um, because I have a dog and I walk my dog every day, it just helps me be a nicer person. So I, you know, um, I'm easier to live with because of this. I do feel peaceful in the garden, in the woods, hiking, cooking, bird watching, stargazing, and sitting zazen. And that is until I have to share a garden plot, decide which path to walk, which food to cook, etc. So this is the time for practicing the paramitas for me. A few days ago, RJ and I were talking. Where would I give my talk? I want to do it downstairs by myself, but the computer's upstairs. So I said, no way, I'm just gonna do it on my phone like I always do. You and the dog will be on, in my way and you'll make me nervous. I could have opened my heart. Geez, I'm nervous. I could have used my mind. Can you think about this with me? Fear triggered confusion in me. I don't feel brave enough to discuss how I could get my needs met here. So I said, you were in my way and I'm sorry about that. So I'm a human in earth school. 
And um, all I can do is just keep cultivating Pema's open and inquiring mind of prajna. Keep seeing myself and try being brave enough to get out of my own way and connect with people, family, community, friends, sangha. And um, that's all I have to say today. And I'm I'm leaving uh, I'm leaving my talk early. <laughs> um, and um, um, and uh, but I welcome um, any comments or questions that people have. <laughs>